Kota. Hello and welcome. Losing a loved one to war, one of the most difficult challenges for anyone to face, but even tougher for those who are in the thick of fighting. So how do they cope? For some Israelis and Palestinians, the answer lies in laying down their arms and pledging never to fight again. Known as combatants for peace, these former enemies have come together and are now working against occupation, violence and settlements. Their new mission is a battle for hearts and minds and it often pits them against their own governments, uh, the public and former comrades in arms. On today's show we ask, how do you move forward from a decades-old conflict and do former fighters make the best soldiers for peace? Well, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments, send an SMS or an email and we'll take your phone calls on the show. Joining me now is Bassam Aramin, on the found, one of the founders of Combatants for Peace, who spent seven years in prison for his involvement in attacks against Israeli soldiers. Mr. Aramin lost his 10-year-old daughter, Abir, who was killed by an Israeli soldier while standing outside her school. Also joining us is Elik Alhanan, a former Israeli combat soldier who served from 1995 to 1998. He was born and raised in Jerusalem and was proud to join the army. He lost his sister, Smadar, to a suicide attack in Jerusalem more than 10 years ago. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you both to the program. Now, Combatants for Peace is marking its fifth anniversary, for which we should congratulate you. And Bassam, uh, I, uh, if I could start with you, please, first. Um, it's a tribute to the dedication and resolve of people like yourselves and Elik, who have uh, come together to try to fight the violence and, and push for peace. In spite of some of these tragic losses that we've described just now in the, in the introduction, how much progress have you seen with Combatants for Peace? How much do you find it is building momentum and gathering support? Yeah, thank you. Actually, we can see the result from like, our number. We start this organization in 2005 by uh, 11 people, Palestinians and Israelis. And now we are around 600 people growing uh, slowly. Uh, it's not by the to sell or to buy the people it's to convince them by your way and uh, because we are real people it means we was in the other side we break the violence we use the armed struggle against the occupation and the Israelis are the same and we reach to the point that this conflict cannot be solved in a military solution and our experience is uh, uh, the reality more than 100 years we are killing each other so we bring to ourselves more pain and more conflict and uh, more victims and we continue in this circle of violence, act and react, revenge, without thinking that we need to stop this way because simply it doesn't work. Right. But so this is exactly yeah. what Combatants for Peace did. Right. Now well, how much harder is your job? How much harder is it to build support? when you face issues such as the, the Gaza situation uh, at the end of last year and, and the, uh, the situation with the Gaza flotilla recently? Yeah, absolutely. It's very hard. It's very difficult because you think that you are swimming against the direction. And in, in this situation, I think we have uh, the, both the Palestinians and Israeli have good reasons to, to continue this conflict. But we know our way. It's very clear for us they will never win us means we will never go back to the violence because we prove that with non-violence active this is the only way to liberate ourselves to liberate our land and we believe that Slavs will never liberate themselves the, the, right. their land uh, just the courage people and the, uh, when you make peace with yourself and right. liberate yourself you can liberate your land. Okay. So this is our responsibility as a Palestinians and also as Israelis. Let me bring in Elik Alhanan here. Really good to have you on the show as well. And congratulations on the fifth and reaching the fifth anniversary of the uh, combatants for peace. Uh, I wonder, in light of those recent tensions I was discussing with Bassam just now, um, what sort of reaction have you had in, uh, from Israelis and, and people, I guess, on the other side of the fence um, when it comes to showing that you are refusing, you know, to use military force when you want to try to push for peace? How much resistance? do you face? Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having us. It's a pleasure and thank you very much for your uh, congratulations. Uh, of course, we face uh, pretty strong resistance. The discourse in Israel is growing uh, more and more extreme as the situation becomes more and more uh, desperate. However, I do think that unlike uh, in the past, where the idea of not serving in the army, of standing out against uh, the state's policies in such uh, an explicit way, 
was unthinkable. Today, many more people understand that, well, Israeli government and the Israeli policies have gone bankrupt, and uh, people do right. understand that other that we have something right. to say and they want to listen. Now we can see that in the numbers of uh, young soldiers joining us. Now you were actually uh, glad to join the military when you uh, when you were young, when you were uh, first uh, involved in the military, and uh, I wonder in what way has your view of Palestinians changed in that time since you've become uh, an activist for peace. Well, uh, it's not that it changed. It, it was created through my activities with Palestinians. As an Israeli living in a state that is, uh, not to say the explicit word, but very near an apartheid regime, I never met Palestinians. I never had any contact with Palestinians before serving in the, in the military. And while serving in the military, I didn't have any relation to them other, as, other than as enemies or something like that. It was through my activities in the Israeli-Palestinian Bereaved Family Forum and above all in Combatants for Peace, the very close work with wonderful people like Bassam and uh, other friends who formed the group to, that we formed the group together with, that's how I met uh, the Palestinians. This is how I formed my opinions of them. This is how I discovered basically everything I know. I must say that it is a shame, but from a situation of knowing nothing in my early 20s, I moved to a situation now where I feel that I have a, a good connection and a very strong belief and a great deal of respect for the Palestinian mm -hmm. people and their struggle. Now, there's an uncanny similarity between both of your stories. There's some, there's some tragic common uh, themes in both of your lives. Bassam Aramin, take me through, uh, you, you know, w briefly your story how it all started for you as a youngster, as a boy, on the streets, challenging Israeli soldiers. I think as a youngster, you, you were about 12 years old when you witnessed a boy in the demonstrations being shot and killed right next to you. That's right. And uh, then I feel that deeply I need to revenge. As a, as a, as a kid, I think there's no choice for me just to, to defend myself or my own freedom as a child then it's a grow with you that you need to live free as a human being. Uh, you don't understand why those strange people came to occupy you or to control your life. Then I found myself when I was uh, 17 years old uh, uh, in the Israeli jail uh, after I uh, used like uh, uh, throw stones and we create a local military group of uh, uh, like uh, young people to, uh, to attack the Israeli soldiers. And it was uh, after like uh, uh, seven years in the Israeli jails, which was very heavy and very strong. And in jail, you just learn how to hate and how to be more determined to continue your army struggle against this brutal enemy who want to kill you, uh, to kill uh, your humanity every day. But it's it's a long process. It's full of like uh, of pain. But we learn how to use your pain. Uh, for another way. It's not just for revenge and more fighting. We are fighting to liberate ourselves to have peace and not only uh, or not just to, uh, to die. And then uh, recently, uh, uh, three years ago on the 16th of January 2007, unfortunately I lost my 10 years old daughter uh, Abir in front of her school by an Israeli border police with an American rubber bullet from an American <coughs> M16 from an American Jeep. Uh, for nothing in a normal day and uh, again it's easy to go to the easy way to revenge and hateness but uh, I didn't find the answer to kill an Israeli uh, 10 years right. old daughter yeah. and I claim that and also uh, Elik we agree that who kill uh, Abir and kill Smadar it's the same brutal enemy it's the occupation okay. and the hateness and the violence uh, so it it's not personal we need to to right. know how to use our pain in a, a different way. I'm going to ask you a little bit uh, in a little while about how your, your efforts to find some resolution has, uh, has, has gone. But let me ask Alec here, uh, at what point did your attitude change? Was there a trigger point for you where you really realized that you had to find a different path? Um. Well, I can't really say that my attitude uh, had changed. When I joined the military, my positions were already pretty left-wing in Israeli standards. I believed in peace. I believed in dialogue with the Palestinians. 
I just didn't see the contradiction between that and my military service. And the, I think the moment I understood it was after the murder of my sister in 1997. Uh, she was killed in a suicide bombing by Hamas uh, activists in uh, the center of Jerusalem. And when I was confronted with this aspect of the conflict, with the price that one has to pay, looking around me for help, looking around me for support, all I saw and all I got was calls for revenge. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I understood that if I move in circles that have nothing to offer except revenge and more violence and more bloodshed, I must act. I must go out and find and, or and, uh, create new circles where there'll be more uh, better hope. And Alec, you were only uh, 14, uh, 18 at the time and, and Smother was only uh, 14. Um, at that point, um, you said, you said, you know, I've, I've read since you said that she deserves better than to be remembered in such a sad fashion. Her death needs a better remembrance. And uh, wh in what way did you mean that? Um, I mean, we have a tendency as any kind of warring society of making martyrs of our enemies and pretending that those sacrifice were worth, was worthwhile, putting them on pedestals and writing their names on monuments and pretending that they had to die. I'm saying that's not true. My sister needs to remember for, remembered for her sacrifice that was a pointless, was a meaningless sacrifice in the service of the occupation and a monument that I would like to see in the memory of my sister, in the memory of Abir, in the memory of all the children that died in this conflict, will be a just and peaceful solution. This would be a remembrance I can live with and I think will do honor to my sister and to all the okay. martyrs of this conflict. Any other way that justifies the way that they died or justifies the policies that brought to their death, I think it's, uh, well, it's nothing less than contempt of the dead. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you some viewer questions when we return. We take a short break here. When we come back, we'll look at how those who step back from a conflict in the name of peace often become the target of suspicion of their own people. Don't go away. Welcome back. After more than 60 years of conflict, some Israelis and Palestinians are laying down their arms and choosing peace. But is anyone in their leadership listening? With me in Ramallah is Bassam Aramin, a former Palestinian fighter who spent seven years in prison for his involvement in attacks against Israelis, and Elik El Hanan, a former Israeli combat soldier who volunteered to join the Israeli Special Forces at the age of 18. He's in Jerusalem. Now, both have lost very close family members in the conflict. But as members of Combatants for Peace, they are renouncing violence. They're also actively pursuing dialogue and engaging in acts of civil disobedience as a way of finding a resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As I get back to some questions, uh, Bassam Aramin, I want to put a viewer question to you, please. This came in from Nairobi, Kenya, and our viewer by the name of Mohammed Abd wrote in saying, unless the U.S. commits itself sincerely to bringing peace between Palestine and Israel, the killing will persist. The U.S. has hidden agendas in this war. And I wonder, Bassam, do you think it's going to take America to res resolve this? Can it be resolved by Israelis and Palestinians alone, or will it need the intervention of a country like America? Uh, actually, that's right. I think, I think uh, that both of us, Palestinians and Israeli, are uh, victims. We like to live as victims since long times. Uh, victims for the American policy. In the same time, no one can liberate us except the Palestinians and Israeli because it's our lives and it's our responsibility to, to protect our lives. Uh, in the end of the day, I think we need, politically, we need the, uh, the United States of America to put an end to this uh, uh, crimes and to this uh, occupation because uh, every year they support Israel with three billion uh, dollar uh, military aid and I call the Americans to invest uh, this uh, this uh, sum of money in peace instead of to invest it uh, on our blood and our suffering. 
Right. Let me bring in Alec here with an email question that we got from a viewer by the name of uh, Basil Mohesen, who wrote in saying, this war is a long-term strategic war with goals and targets, most of which are purely evil. It is bigger than the politicians who are mere puppets serving the interests of larger powers, whether Israeli, Palestinian, or American. I do know that as combatants for peace, though, uh, especially with the, the Israeli authorities, they do try to make your life, life difficult. I think they, you, you have incidents where they're obviously trying to oppose you getting that voice of peace out. What sort of obstacles do you face? Well, one of our members was called in for an, uh, a better behave talk by the Israeli security services, Jonathan Shapira, the other day. Mm -hmm. and, but these kind of incidents are uh, rather rare. Mostly what we face is a complete and utter uh, disregard. No one will talk to us, no one will acknowledge us, no one will make any effort to hear our voice, not in the, so and not in the society and definitely not in the political level. When we try to come forward with this message of soldiers putting down their arms, politicians run away, even left-wing politicians. One uh, prominent politician from the Meretz party told us quite frankly that he thinks it's a good idea, but he doesn't have the courage, he has a career to think about. Um, we found ourselves in front of a very big, a, a very thick barrier, which is a politician's cowardness and the complacence of the media with that, that simply would not allow us to uh, bring our message out to the Israeli public that makes us look marginal and uh, insignificant, while in fact, if you look at the way this group has grown, I think that uh, the opposite is the truth. Well, let me bring a, an email question here for uh, Bassam Aramin again, and this is uh, from Sudan, from a viewer by the name of Mamur, uh, who wrote in saying, some Palestinians and Israelis may lay down their arms, but how will peace be implemented since others remain armed on both sides? And how will both parties address their wounded memories? And I wonder, you and Elik have both been very brave in dealing with your very close family losses, uh, and I wonder how easy it is for most of you, the people on the Palestinian and Israeli side, to be able to put aside this dark history that you both share? It's very simply my message that uh, uh, the Holocaust is over and, uh, w and the Nakba is over, uh, but in some ways she's continued. It means we are not going to be prisoners to our past and to our darkness. We can talk about s our suffering more than 60 years, and the Israelis are the same, and we are, we are killing each other in the name of the history, in the name of revenge, in the name of this black history. Mm -hmm. And we need to look forward to protect our children and our families and ourselves. Uh, so uh, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. We need to liberate ourselves, in spite the pain, in spite the victims. Um, now, Bassam, in spite uh, on this on uh, this uh, note, our lost yeah. right on this note. Until the issue of Abir's uh, death is is resolved, until you have closure on what actually happened, because I know you're fighting it in the courts and it's been very difficult for you. But until you resolve your own issues, can you feel that there can be resolution for the whole of the Middle East? Can you feel peace until you find your own answers for, for Abir's death? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if I didn't believe in what I'm doing, uh, I'm not going to lose my time. Two years ago, before Abir's killing, my message was to protect our children on both sides because they are the most innocent people. And unfortunately, are the, the, they are paying the highest price in this dirty conflict. And when it's happened to me, Abir is like the other Palestinian and Israeli kids who have been killed in the name of this conflict. So, uh, yeah, I think. I was very active before, but after Abir, I think it was my life became my message to protect the Israelis and the Palestinians as the same. And all the time I say they, they are all our children and they deserve our protection. Uh, Elik, I have an email that came from Nairobi in Kenya from Joseph Wanjohi, who wrote in saying, does combatants for peace believe that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict will ever be amicably resolved in our generation? This would be a big step towards world peace. Do you feel that you, ex you will see some kind of real long-term peace in your lifetime? Wow, 
That's the hard question. Yes, as Bassam said, if I, uh, if I wouldn't believe that, I wouldn't be wasting my time doing this. I wouldn't be spending so much energy and so much heartache on this, uh, on this conflict. Now, uh, there used to be a slogan once that accompanied struggles that said, you know, let's be realistic and dem demand the impossible. Looking at the reality today in Israel and Palestine, the reality of this conflict, the reality of our political uh, leaders, one can hardly imagine how this conflict will be resolved. But I think that this is our determination and our duty as citizens and as people who live in this region to change the course of this logic and to change the course of history and to make what seems impossible possible. I absolutely agree with the email that this is a very important and imperative step for uh, world peace. And I think that this duty lies on us to take control of our politics, of our lives, of our destinies, and make a difference. If we can do that, we can bring about the impossible. Well, and I want as to. As Sam said, we started mm -hmm. 11. We're nearly 600 now. And do you feel, just a quick thought, do you feel that number will continue to grow, Alec? Can you persuade more people? Absolutely. Absolutely, without a doubt. Okay. I, I want to thank you there for joining us. I, I'm sorry because we're out of time. Thanks again for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and catch recent episodes there. Be sure to post your questions and see what other viewers are saying about the topics we cover. On the next show, we look at the rise of so-called state capitalism. How sustainable are government-controlled markets, and could they be the next threat to global growth? We'll be joined by Ian Bremer, the author of The End of the Free Market. Make sure you send in your questions and comments for that, and tune in from me and the team. Until then, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.